everyone. I'm Josie Acuna, um, with obviously with my colleague here, Dr. Shri Karatakari. We're from the University of Arizona. Um, I'm going to talk a little fast just so we don't go over, but um, today we're going to be talking to you about pre-intubation ultrasound, um, a technique maybe some of you are not as familiar with, but it's getting pretty popular. So let's get started. Do I have a clicker? No. No disclosures, so makes that easy someday. Our objectives for today, so I'm going to be doing the first two. We're going to explore airway anatomy on ultrasound, learn how to quickly, and quickly is a key word, identify uh, key upper airway structures, because obviously time is of the essence. If you already know you're going to intubate a patient, you want to be able to do this efficiently. Um, I'll talk a little bit about pathology and anatomical variances on ultrasound that can predict a difficult airway. Um, and then Shrikar is going to take over and teach you about how to perform a hemodynamic ultrasound. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Um, and hopefully by the end of this, you will be able to develop a strategy of your own that you can effectively integrate into pre-intubation ultrasound. So you can take little bits of it, obviously take what you will, see what fits your practice the best, but I think in some way or another, it should be part of your um, airway setup. So this is a view that you wanna get. It's pretty easy to get, even on a patient with a, you know, a large thick neck or some distorted anatomy. You use the linear probe, you just place it in Transverse orientation, you can also get longitudinal views as well. The trachea is going to be front and center. I mean, um, it's not a difficult technique to learn, and this is why I think this can be helpful for any emergency physician, whether you are ultrasound trained, super ultrasound savvy or not. Just to go over the anatomy a little bit, um, did this one have a pointer in it? No. Anyway, in the near field, you're going to see some of that soft tissue. When this becomes thickened or um, edematous from some sort of pathology, um, this is going to be more prominent, so make sure you pay attention to the neck thickness. Underneath, highlighted in red, are the strap muscles. Um, we are at the level of the thyroid gland here, so it kind of overlies the uh, trachea here like a little butterfly. That first hypochoic line there is the tracheal cartilage. And just deep to that, just so you know these structures, because this comes up a lot, that hyperechoic structure is the air mucosal interface. And then you notice these kind of... Um, repetitive lines underneath. A lot of our, our you know, novice ultrasonographers are like, oh, those are the tracheal rings. It is not. <laughs> it is just reverberation artifact. I don't know, everyone always thinks like, oh, those are the rings right there, that's so cool. And then you're like, no, it's not, sorry. I don't wanna burst your bubble. Um, and then esophagus. Esophagus is probably more important if you're actually using ultrasound to um, guide your intubation, like during your actual intubation, in case you are worried you're gonna goose the patient. Um, might be a little bit less of a problem now with all of our video laryngoscopy, but the esophagus normally lies n to the uh, left of the trachea. There are some anatomical variants there. You're not always going to see it. Sometimes the esophagus is posterior to the trachea a little bit, so um, all of that air just kind of obscures it, or sometimes in a very few cases it's over on the right. So um, if you don't see it, not, not a bad thing. Sometimes it's just hidden. Another view as you go a little more superiorly into the neck are going to be your false cords and your retinoids. These are mine. I think they're kind of large, so that's worrisome if I <laughs> ever get intubated. Um, again, I have my own handheld at home, so a lot of these images you kind of sit at home and scan yourself, and it gets weird. But I'm not scanning my children yet, my Dr. Adhikari here. That's to come. Uh, another anatomical variant to be aware of is when you get older patients, sometimes you're going to get this view, and this is because over time, you know, later decades in life, 70s, 80s, 90s, the cartilage actually becomes calcified. So over in this view back here, notice how much detail I have of the cords and the retinoids. When you have that calcification, you're just not gonna see much of anything. So keep that in mind. It gets, as people get older, it might be a little more difficult. Um, another variant you might see, and I couldn't find really great images of this, is um, some patients don't have that completely round trachea. There's something called like a lunate trachea, where you just have an odd um, lunate-shaped, crescent-shaped uh, trachea. Or sometimes there's some old trauma or discontinuities within the laryngeal tracheal structures. Um, obviously, this can be seen with ultrasound. I can't find a great picture for it. But um, in terms of the integrity of the actual trachea itself, if you do a sagittal view like this, this was a patient that had a pre-intubation ultrasound. And they actually found that this patient had had a recent <laughs> laryngeal fracture. Um, you can actually see the discontinuity over here in image C. That's the air mucosal interface, that hyperechoic line, and you can see the discontinuity over in the final image. So again, very quick, easy to get. Uh, I truly think it can take about two minutes to do the whole exam, just focusing on how you're going to intubate someone. 
Um, we'll go over just a few cases just so I can show you the importance of certain measurements and how it can help you. Um, so prior to intubation, we often will kind of even glance at the patient's neck just to get kind of an idea of, of what we're going to, you know, be up against. When we see this neck on the right, it's like, oh, you know, great, this is along the neck. I can palpate, you know, um, you know an anatomic landmarks. Um, you know, there's, there's a chin. Unfortunately, sometimes our patients are, have necks like the one on the left, and we already know the laryngoscopy in this situation is just not going to be as easy, most likely, as, the, as our other patient. So this is tricky, right? So you're in the setting where you have, say, this woman, she's older, she's, you know, difficult to pre-oxygenate, you see that the neck is, is quite thick, and then you, well, if you have, like, a med student with you who's, like, ready to do my first intubation, do you want to let your most novice learner go for this airway? One thing you can do is measure the neck thickness using ultrasound. And there are different areas where you can measure neck thickness. Um, I had no idea how far back some of this literature went. Um, there was a study by Shrikar, actually, you did the hyoid. That was like over 10 years ago. I mean, I was in medical school, I think, when this paper was written. Again, this is not novel stuff. It's just becoming a little more popular recently, especially in emergency medicine. A lot of these studies were done by anesthesia to try to, everyone's always trying to predict that difficult airway. You can measure the neck thickness from the vocal cord, at the level of vocal cord, the hyoid, and epiglottis. But what are the numbers you're looking for? This is something I haven't found a completely, I haven't found true agreement on what that number is at each level. The most common number I'm seeing for vocal cords on hyoid is 2.8, plus or minus maybe you know a, a millimeter or so. Um, any neck neck that's greater than 2.8 when you're measuring at the level of the vocal cords and the hyoid, that's automatically a predictor of difficult laryngoscopy. So if you have someone that's you know has a potential to crash and you know they're going to have really difficult laryngoscopy, maybe have that medical student try their first intubation on someone else. The epiglottis, a little bit of a different way to measure as um, opposed to the vocal cords and hyoid. You're measuring from the top of the screen all the way down to that epiglottis. And this one's actually been researched more than the vocal cords and hyoid. As I was doing this um, presentation, I think maybe two or three weeks ago, um, this meta-analysis actually came out. I don't know how many of you get the, um, like the spoon feed articles on your um, email, but this came out and it actually was a meta of all of these index numbers I was just researching and had all of them put together. So I did some of this legwork for nothing. Somebody was already doing it. Um, they were looking at all the index values for um, neck thickness with hyoid, vocal cords, and the epiglottis. And you can see that the sensitivity for predicting a difficult laryngoscopy is actually pretty good. There weren't a ton of studies out there. Again, a lot of them were older too. And one caveat to this is a lot of these were with, um, a lot of these were direct. So I think for future study ideas, if you happen to be looking for something, is comparing this to um, doing a study with VL. Anyway, um, you can read the article. It's really great. The main take home point from this uh, meta was that airway ultrasound index tests are significantly different between patients with easy versus difficult laryngoscopy. Um, distance from the skin to epiglottis was the one that was most studied in this meta to predict uh, difficult airway. All right, case two. This case I like because this was a, a just a really changed the, the course of this patient's um, management in the hospital. So another thing you can do with ultrasound is to look at the diameter of the trachea, not only for cuff size. Um, this is really popular in a lot of pediatric literature because it's just so a lot of our decision rules to um, pick the appropriate um, tube sizes just because they're not they're not great. Um, especially for children. Um, we also want to be able to evaluate for subglottic tracheal stenosis, which I am suddenly seeing so, so many cases now because of COVID. So many people had, I can't even count on anything, a number of patients I had that I would follow up that just lived in the ICU for weeks or months with the trach. And, you know, once the trach is finally removed, they're just left with a subglottic stenosis and this difficult airway for life. So this patient, oops, oh, I gave out, good finding. This patient I had was, um, got COVID the first round, ended up with a trach, it was removed. Then of course the poor thing, I got, she had subglottic stenosis, tracheal stenosis and ended up getting COVID again. So I'm seeing her when she is in the ED, there is no chance for her to get an ICU bed in sight and she's already about to max out on her 
high flow, and I knew this was not somebody that we had any sort of resources to intubate in the emergency department. I knew she had a terrible um, tracheal stenosis. I wanted some more data to get ENT down to scope her for us or to get just literally anyone to come down because the, the times are rough in our hospital right now. This is a normal tracheal diameter on the right. Look at this on the left. Why isn't it playing? Anyway, you can tell that this, this is her on the left. That is a much smaller tracheal diameter. The normal um, diameter is going to be, well, anything less than 1.5 centers, five centimeters is subtracheal stenosis. Hers was point, it wasn't even half a centimeter, and I thought I was being really generous with measuring the trachea. So I was like, we're not doing this. Like, there's no way. I, I don't even think that she was really a great candidate for fiber optic, which could be one of your other choices here if you have somebody with a pretty bad stenosis. She was not a good candidate for that. She was already stridulous, very, very anxious. She would not have handled it well. Um, called ENT down. They came down right away once we told her what we saw. They um, brought in their scope, and they said, like, no. Like, none of us are doing this down here. This woman needs to go up to the OR. Um, they said as they went even further down her trachea with the scope, it got even smaller past to where I was able to make my measurements. Um, she went up to the OR. They showed this picture to anesthesia, and anesthesia's like, what do you want us? We're, we're not going to intubate her. What do you think? This poor woman ended up with another trach. She's doing okay, but I think if I hadn't had this, I think it w everything would have been delayed. God, God forbid I would have tried to intubate her. That would have been horrible. Um, this is another super quick measurement. You're just measuring a diameter. You're remembering that number, 1.5. Anything below that, just be really careful. And I think you're going to see a lot more of these, more so than ever, because I, before this, I had never been measuring tracheas and seen so many um, cases of this. How are we doing on time? Okay. Um, one last case. I don't see a lot of epiglottitis. But when you do, it's always a scary, uh, scary sight. So we have a patient coming in who's just floridly septic, anterior neck pain. Um, you know, she's febrile. She's not really tolerating your secretions. One of our biggest concerns is this person has epiglottitis. You don't like how she's struggling. You don't want to send her the CT scanner. Even if I wanted to, our CT wait times are like seven hours now at this point. Um, one thing, another thing we do is pull out that ultrasound Look for this hypoechoic structure. Um, it's a little more superior in the neck. Sometimes it's hard to see, especially if it's normal in a patient. It's not going to be that thick, and you just measured a diameter. So what's the number we're looking for this one? Greater than three millimeters is going to be an enlarged epiglottis. This one was a whopping <laughs> 6.2 centimeters. This is a horrible case of epiglottitis. This is somebody that we wanted to keep our eye on in the department. If we did send them to CT, we want to make sure somebody goes with them. Um, And then the last, my last case, sorry this got cut off here. I, I was worried about your slides, but apparently it was mine. Mm. <laughs> so in all algorithms of difficult airway management, the final step is gonna be oxygenation through the cricothyroid membrane. It's rare we ever get to that because I think we're all amazing, we're all prepared, and every so once in a while these cases still come up. Um, so for that reason, we really wanna make sure if we ever do come into that case that we wanna make sure once again, not only are we predicting for that difficult endotracheal intubation, but also a difficult surgical airway. And you may have done this um, in the past. This is another nice, easy view to get. You just want to use a longitudinal view so you have that probe in a long axis over the neck. I sometimes have my um, residents actually look for the tracheal rings first at the bottom, because as you'll see at the top, they're very prominent. I feel like our learners just seem to find those easier and then make their way up until they kind of count cartilage. So they see all the tracheal rings, they see cricothyroid cartilage, then they see a, um, just a period of that as a cricothyroid membrane. Whether they do it or not, we tell them if you have somebody that looks like they would have, you're going to intubate, looks like they might have a difficult airway, just, just put an X there. Again, no time at all. You can do this in minutes. They may do it when I'm there. I don't know if they do it if I'm not there, but I, I tried. These are my references, but I'm going to move on. I can ask uh, any questions you have. I'd be happy to answer later, and I will hand this over to Dr. Adhikari.